Today, um, we're joined by Mark Kirkelberg, the Professor of Philosophy of Technology and Media, Media and Technology at the University of Vienna. And you've written 10, 11, 12 books <laughs> um, in the area of philosophy and a lot more recently on um, philosophy of technology and things like that. And so today I'd be, I'm interested in a kind of set of three books that you've published recently that each deal with an aspect of technology that's kind of counterintuitive. Um, so you have the book Words and Things, which analyzes the close connection between artifacts and language um, and the relationship between those two. And then you've also published a book um, called New Romantic Cyborgs, yes. which is about the influence of romanticism on technology. So we would tend to think of technology as the domain of rationality and kind of enlightenment values and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but as you say, that it's sort of romantic views of technology um, connect with the irrational and the kind of fantastic. And then the final book that you've published recently is called Moved by Machines, uh, which looks at the relationship between performance and technology, which again isn't necessarily the first thing. So um, you look at um, drama and music and even philosophy itself as a performance. Um, so I'd like to ask some questions about each of these. Um, first of all, briefly, in what ways are technology and language alike? Yeah, I think both technology and language, um, we, we use it to reach certain goals. Um, there's in philosophy of language this famous line that um, we do things with words and partly that means that we, we want other people to do things and we, we use words for that purpose. But more generally we use them as a kind of tools really to, to uh, reach our aims and that's precisely also what we say of technology. Um, now in the, in the book um, Using Words and Things I make another analogy which um, helps me to, um, to conceptualize how technologies are always embedded in a wider um, cultural and social context. And that's by using Wittgenstein, um, saying that um, if we look at language, according to Wittgenstein, we use words and um, the meaning of these words is uh, really not a matter of a kind of um, object or a fixed kind of meaning, but um, depends on the, on, on the use of the words and use of the words is always connected to the activities we do um, and, and to other wider things he calls games and forms of life, um, which can be interpreted as a kind of cultural environment um, with rules and so on um, that's always there and, and which of course social scientists are very good in, in making explicit. And what, what I do then is saying like, well, if if this is what language is like, then maybe technology is also like that. Maybe technology is also something that's not just about artifacts, but is actually related to uh, the games we play, is related to the form of life. Um, and, and the meaning of technology is not just the, the technical meaning, but is also the meaning that comes from this wider cultural context. Um, and so in this way, I think, I mean, this is one way we can conceptualize that technology is more than only this, this um, technical layer. Mm. I guess I'm interested in the, from the kind of Deleuzean perspective of the assemblage, um, Deleuze would sort of say that language operates not just at the level of games and um, um, formal structures and even speech acts, but starts even with sound um, or with affect. Um, and similarly, technology, you would say. And so I'm just curious about what the limits are in a kind of Wittgenstein reading of language games and technology games, mm -hmm. where it's open up to those um, kind of pre-linguistic um, variations. Yeah, at, at first sight, um we bounce here against the limitations of the metaphor, 
But if we actually look further in Wittgenstein, um, especially uncertainty, um, there is an aspect in Wittgenstein that actually um, uh, th th there is some attention to, to the bodily um, uh, dimension, um, especially when he when he talks about um, about the hands um, and, and the, the knowledge that's that's in there. Um, we see that actually his epistemology can be compatible with contemporary thinking in terms of um, um, embodied cognition uh, and, and a more skillful uh, practical relation to the world. Um, so I think if we if we add that to the to the picture which, which I also partly did um, especially in, in articles that more fo uh, you know, zoom in on Wittgenstein um, then, then we can we can also transfer that to technology. Um, because technology is um, is, is definitely also um, a matter not only of uh, using language alongside the technology, but also um, doing things with our body, uh, skillfully engaging with the world, with the technologies. Um, so there, there's no again, there's no uh, also on the side of the human. There's there's no um, kind of disembodied mind there. Uh, that, that uses technology or that's engaged in technological action in a sort of abstract way, as some analytic philosophers would, would, would you know, conceptualize it. Yeah, and you also bring Heidegger into play to the kind of questions of being in the world and thrownness and mm -hmm. um, those sorts of concepts. That yeah, I think a more sort of existential phenomenological approach can uh, highlight that we as users of technology are these sort of vulnerable beings uh, are beings that are you know have a certain existential condition um, and uh, yeah I mean, you know, f just as an example uh, Günther Anders uh, in, in history of, of philosophy he um, he suggested that um, there is a discrepancy between our devices which are these shiny Almost eternal things, um, uh, and and us who are not so perfect as our de devices, uh, who are you know, who are going to die and so on. But I've never found I've never found a perfect device. <laughs> I, I I agree with that. So I think that there's a, there's a problem here with with the thing. But 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 I think what I learned from this kind of um, claims is. Um, that we should definitely um, think about what kind of what is the image of the human here in uh, when we think about technology, um, and that's important to to see that and to see this human as as an embodied vulnerable mortal person. So I mean that makes a sort of nice segue into the second book, which is um, new new romantic cyborgs, um, and in that you identify role of romanticism in not only the imaginary but actually in the kind of practice or relationship to technology. So what is, we usually think of technology as being about rationality or about mm. um, sort of yes. clarity and precision, but in what way does romanticism come into play? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, Usually, technology is, is connected with with the technical, and for for a good reason, of course. Um, but once we consider the user as a human being, um, then that user has emotions, and that user um, has has certain aspirations. And I think uh, what we inherited from uh, the Romantics is our continuous kind of. Um, fascination with technology but also fear um, our longing also for um, a merger of matter and spirit in the end uh, longing for a kind of healing of the world um, uh, as, a, as a reaction to to a modern world that's supposed to be disenchanted um, I think this is still very much uh, a part of our cultural heritage and therefore of the meanings of technology also. Um, so the, the various aspects of romanticism that, that can be used. 
Um, also, the uh, utopian ideas about uh, a society that's you know very different than ours, uh, that that's much better. And does do dystopian ideas also sort of rely on romanticism or connect with romanticism? Of course, very much so. Um, it, it's the utopia and dystopia are sort of married. Um, many dystopian narratives are uh, exactly there to, to um, call attention for, for the human and the emotional as opposed to the uh, technological rationality. Um, for example, the, the idea of uh, you know, taking pills that suppress emotions and that make us more rational. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's also a film about that. It's a typical romantic mm -hmm. reaction against the world that's supposed to be um, disenchanted. And then, of course, it's important to, from a critical point of view, to, to question this, right? Is that the case? One film that really um, reminds me of that sort of issue is um, Darren Aronofsky's film Pi. Pi. I don't know if you ever saw that film. I didn't see that. No. Well, in, in that, um, the central character is obsessed with numbers mm -hmm. and the belief that if you had the perfect kind of formula or numerical experience that you could predict um, anything, including the stock market and so on. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the character really sort of descends into insanity and the film sort of moves out into abstraction. And um, yeah, yeah. yeah, you should check it out. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's, that's uh, interesting. I also like the um, uh, book and, and film uh, Cosmopolis. Uh, which is also this kind of uh, how how things get out of control. Not and it's not a technology that gets out of control. In the end, it's the it's the the social situation, by the way. Also, and, and it's as, as a human being, you know. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, but but I think it's yeah it's it's wrong to always op oppose technology against a human because in the end, technology is. Uh, it's very human. We we make it, and uh, and we can also uh, influence its direction. Yeah, and in that kind of McLuhan sense, is it, it's an extension. Or a yes, yes. I think it's not only an ex extension. Uh, it can also be a, a medium, for example, and a kind of environment. It can be an infrastructure. There's a lot of different ways to think about technology. Um, but but yes, extension is, is one way to do that and to, to stress how much technology is connected to us. One question I have about the sort of figure of romanticism, um, I guess, is there an outside to romanticism? Is, there, is um, romanticism a kind of ideology that's about obscuring some truth or, um, or is there possibility of narrative without some sort of or is, is, is rationality actually better than romanticism? Okay, I, I think once we um, start discussing this kind of questions, like if rationality is better, the problem is that we stay within a kind of romantic order, uh, which, which can get nearly totalitarian in the sense that, that, that it looks like there is no outside. Because then we have a discussion of you know, one person defending rationality and uh, coming from the Enlightenment side, say, and another person reacting against that um, uh, and, 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 and defending emotions uh, and the human against technology and science. So um, it's, it's easy to be stuck in that. And another example is if we think of alternatives to our, um, the way we organize our, our societies and our economies, um, we could look at non-modern uh, ways of dealing with the world. And I think that's an interesting direction to try to get out of also the romantic framing, which is still very modern. So we could look at, at non-modern hunter-gatherer practices, for example, and they're, they're really great anthropologists um, like Tim Ingold who study these cultures and who in a way get us towards what I would call a less dualist and less modern view. Um, uh, think also of Latour, you know, we, um, but, but the, the problem is that um, this easily slips into the view that there was a pre-modern world that's, that's better 
than our current world and that everything was better then. Mm -hmm. And so the, the kind of ro romantic sure nostalgia. McLuhanist kind of um, arc of human history. Right. right moral yeah, culture. Yeah. Yeah. So th this, is a, this is a problem. So it is actually difficult to, to go beyond the romantic order. Um, uh, but, but, but our only chance of doing so is, is to, to try to do that. Um, otherwise, we, I think th this kind of dualistic thinking in the end is not very helpful. Um, and so the third book that you've published recently um, was on, called uh, Moved by Machines, was about performance and technology. And you make the connection between um, drama and music and so in, in what way does technology, is it useful to consider technology as performance? Yeah, so I, I thought let's, let's try to talk about technology by using performance as a metaphor. Um, metaphor, of course, is by itself a very interesting topic and comes also a bit out of this research on technology and language. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, the, the metaphor of uh, choreographing um, is something that yeah normally only is is, is reserved for the arts, um, but I thought why not using it um, also dra drawing on interesting work by by Jana Parviain and uh, um, and why not using it for tr trying to capture um, that when we use technology we are doing so as as moving beings kinetic beings. Uh, so a technology user is again not this this sort of abstraction, um, but but has a body uh, first of all, and and also has a moving body, and that moving body is um, is choreographed by people who design technology and uh, maybe even by the technology itself. Um, a good example is um, the sort of micro movements we make when we operate our mobile phone. The, the way we, we, we make this movement um, is, is defined on beforehand by the, the, the makers of the software. We have to move in a certain way in order to, to make things going. So one could say that yeah, this, this uh, designer, this coder uh, choreographs my movements. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think this is a good example to further investigate um, how uh, how technology, what technology does to us as, as moving beings. Mm. And you also talk about stage magic as an example, which brings up that question of sort of deception yeah. and illusion. And in what way does um, this idea of um, the magical dimension of technology um, and deception provide a way to engage with the ethical questions of technology? Yeah, so um, maybe a, a good example is, is, is social robots. Social robots are um, kind of des designed to deceive, uh, to create an illusion that it's not just a machine, but that it um, can be your companion, your, your partner, and so on. Uh, or that it that it's uh, an animal, uh, but an animal that speaks to you. Uh, there, there are all kind of fantasies and all kind of things are possible, of course. Um, and the question is then, um, how can we understand what's happening there? Well, uh, the metaphor here helps of, of a designer as a stage magician uh, creating this illusion. And it's also interesting for the ethical questions because then one could ask, like, is, is it okay to deceive people? And so if you are doing with sort of virtue ethics, then um, it may be that any type of deception of that type is unethical. It's, it's, it can be problematic to, from a virtue ethics perspective to, to create the habit of um, interacting with machines as if they are humans or as if they are animals. Um, I, I think um, 
what one could do is is say like okay we we have um, we have the ethics of the magician in the sense that we all agree that what happens on stage is not real but it's fun mm -hmm. and so one could say okay let, let you know let's use these social robots um, but it's not that easy as, as, as it is because what if people like uh, like small children um, or elderly people with a certain cognitive impairment. And ironically, uh, that's where the social robotics research is going these days, is to children and elderly people. Yes, yes. Um, uh, often for uh, because robots are developed for you know with the wrong for the wrong reason, namely to to save personnel costs. Um, so, I I think this is indeed where it's going, and and why this kind of metaphor can help us to think through some of these issues. Okay, well, thank you. I, I, I think that should um, cover us for today. And thank Thanks. you very much for your time. It was a pleasure.